Well, winter is hitting all its glory. And so I was curious about how my Model Y would do range wise in the cold. I'd heard so much online that, you know, these things were just awful. And then we heard about that uh, mess in Chicago. So I thought I'd take mine out and, and test it. It worked out nice because I had done a previous video on how efficient it is to roll your windows down in the Model Y. So I had some data from before and I figured I'd go out and redo that same course in the temperatures now and compare the two and see what the difference was. So we're going to cover a couple things in this video. We're first going to look at the range loss in the cold at 50 miles an hour and 75 miles an hour. And then we'll look at best practices and ways that you can actually increase your range or decrease the range loss. And we'll also talk about that mess in Chicago and what might have happened there and how it could have been prevented and what might be done in the future to alleviate some of those issues. And then finally, some of you may recall that last winter, regen braking locked up my rear wheels and initiated a slide that put me in the ditch. Well, I may have some updates on that and it's good news. So that'll be at the end, stick around for that. So let's look at the range data first. Uh, the slide on the left is showing the screen on the cold test on the 50 mile an hour test heading north. As you can see, the temperature is 15 degrees and the average usage is 263 kilowatt hours. On the right image is, you can see the temperature is 78 degrees. This is the one we did in the summer. And the kilowatt average is 195. If we go down and reverse that course, head south, you can see on the cold it's 228 and on the warm test, it's 195. These average out to 245 and a half for the cold tests and 195 for the warm test at 50 miles an hour. This is a 21% loss of efficiency. So let's look at the data at 75 miles an hour. Here we're going west and east and the cold test is at 11 degrees and heading west in the cold test, we got 332 kilowatt hours. The temperature for the warm one is 80 degrees and it was 264 kilowatt hours. We reversed course, came back east and this is a strange number here. We got 433. I checked that several times. That surprised me because I wasn't expecting it to be that big of a difference off the westbound course. Maybe we had a very strong headwind. I'm not sure why that is so far off, but it is. On the warm side, we had 264 going there and we've got 282 coming back. This averages out to 382 and a half for the cold test and 273 for the warm test or a 29% loss in efficiency. Now this actually surprised me because you're using the same amount of energy at 50 miles an hour to heat the cabin as you are at 75 miles an hour. But you're using a heck of a lot more energy to overcome aerodynamic drag at 75, almost double that you are at 50 because aerodynamic drag squares with the speed increase. So I was expecting that this number would actually be lower than the 50 mile an hour number. So the number is not only higher, but it's significantly higher and it throws me for a loop. If you have any ideas why this might be, please leave them in the comments. I would love to be enlightened here. I'm uh, at a complete loss. So then I got wondering, well, you know, the air is thicker when it's colder. How much of this range loss is due to the fact that we're driving through thicker air? So I checked out the densities for the different temperatures. And here you can see at 50 miles an hour, we have an increase in air density of 12% when it's cold out. And at the 75 mile an hour test, because there's a wider range of temperatures here, it's a little higher. It's 13% increase in the thickness of the air. So how much power is required for that thicker air? Well, to find the answer for that, I stumbled across a graph on a video, an excellent video by Engineering Explained, that shows this graph here. And if you look all the way to the left at the 50 mile an hour mark, you'll see that about a third of the power the car is using is used to overcome aerodynamic drag. So we can use that to figure out how much power is required to get through the thicker air. We take one third of the warmer test, the 195, and then we 12% because of the extra dense air. And we find out we have eight kilowatt hours required to overcome the thickness of the air at the 50 mile an hour test. Then we do the same thing down here at 75. Now his test was at 70. 
but at 70, about half the car's energy is being used to overcome aerodynamic drag. It would be a little bit more at 75. And the reason this is, is aerodynamic drag squares with the speed increase. So you're spending a lot more energy at higher speeds, twice as much at 75 as you are at 50 to overcome aerodynamic drag. So again, we take half of the 273 value, which is the average at the normal temperature, 13%, and that gives us a power required for the thicker air of about 17 kilowatt hours. This means that the range loss, once we've removed the extra power required to overcome the thick air, so it's just those losses due to the car itself, are now 18% at the 50 mile an hour test and 25% at the 75 mile an hour test. So three to 4% of that initial loss is due to driving through the thicker air. That's interesting, but we're more interested in real world things. So let's get rid of that for a second and think about, well, your ice car is also less efficient in cold weather. So I went to the EPA site and they actually have a figure here, but the problem is it says fuel economy tests show that in city driving, that's the problem. A conventional gasoline car's gas mileage is roughly 15% lower at 20 degrees Fahrenheit than it would be at 77. Ours was at 11 and 80, so kind of close. But the problem here is that's in city driving. I don't know if this pertains to highway driving. So I went and asked ChatGPT the same thing. And I gave it highway speeds, but it came back with a general instruction too. It said, as a rough estimate, it's not uncommon for a vehicle to experience a reduction in range of around 20 to 22% in very cold temperatures, around 11 degrees, I gave it R degrees, compared to more moderate temperatures, around 80 degrees Fahrenheit. This is a generalization, and the actual reduction can depend on various factors. So, I don't know, would we be safe in saying you get a 15 to 17% decrease in your ICE vehicle on highway? I really don't know because nobody directly addressed that. But if that is the case, it's interesting. You got a 17% decrease in range in your ICE car and you have a 21% decrease in your Tesla Model Y. That a 4% difference between your ICE car, this is certainly not the screaming headlines we've been reading lately. The EPA site does bring up an interesting point about city driving though, because a lot of the energy, extra energy that you're expending in an electric car is to heat the cabin, because unlike an ICE car where you've got heat coming off the engine that you can use to heat the cabin, in an electric car you have to pull energy out of the battery to heat the car. And that energy is going to be the same whether you're sitting at a stoplight or going 75 miles an hour down the road. So obviously the effect in city driving is going to be a lot more. I can't measure that because I can't duplicate city testing consistently, you know, your stoplights and all the rest of that and traffic. You'd have to do a dyno test and obviously that's way beyond my means. But uh, it will be worse during the city for sure. Before we talk about the Chicago mess, let's talk about best practices in the Tesla uh, because that will help us understand the issues in Chicago. The important thing to remember is that battery temperature matters a lot, especially when it's cold. A very cold battery cannot accept a charge. In fact, if you take a cold battery out, you won't have regen. I was kind of surprised by this the other day. I, I've had reduced regen before, but it was below zero here for a couple of days and I didn't drive the car and the battery got really cold soaked. And even though I told it to warm up the cabin, oh, probably five minutes before I left, uh, it brought the cabin temperature up, but apparently it didn't have time to get the battery temperature up because I went out driving. I had no regen at all, which was a very interesting experience. I tried to get my wife to drive it because her big excuse for not driving the Tesla is she doesn't like how the regen braking, the one pedal driving. Uh, her real reason, of course, is that she wants me to be the first one to get the scratch. But she'd have nothing of it. But I tell you, it was really interesting to drive the car and have it act like an ice car. I mean, take your foot off the gas and coast and coast and coast and coast. Uh, it was all very interesting. But there is a way to avoid that. You just schedule departure in advance. And the car's smart enough to bring the battery almost up to temperature and the cabin up to temp by the time you leave. So if you give it 30 to 45 minutes, and either activate the uh, climate control in the app or set the departure time in the app or in the car, then it will have the car ready for you to go and it'll be able to accept regen. 
I should mention that if you want to feel like you have regenerative braking all the time, even when it's reduced or not there, there is a setting in the car that will apply the brakes when regenerative braking is limited. I don't like to use it because I like to know what's going on and I can minimize brake usage that way. But that option is there so the car will always feel like it has a full regen braking. Now when it comes to superchargers, it's important that you put the supercharger as a destination, select it from your app. So let's say go to the nearest supercharger or go to the Moses Lake supercharger. Take me to the nearest supercharger. That way it will preheat the battery before it gets there and it'll be able to accept the full charge from the charger when it does get there. Anyway, making sure that battery is preheated before you get to a supercharger and semi-important, preheated when you leave the house if you want best efficiency. It's simple to do if you've got home charging. Like I said, you just go on the app and you set it under schedule or you turn on the climate 15 to 20 minutes before you're ready to go. And if you're on the road, you just select supercharger as part of your trip or say, take me to the nearest supercharger and it'll preheat it so that it's ready when you get there. The Tesla manual has some other interesting tips, some of which I did not know. It said use the seat heaters to keep warm because they use less energy than the cabin heater. That makes sense. And then you can lower the temperature in the cabin, use the seat heater to keep yourself warm. Slow down your driving and avoid frequent and rapid acceleration. Obviously a hard acceleration burns more than a soft acceleration, which brings me to the next point, which I had not considered though. You can improve the efficiency of the cabin heating by reducing your selected acceleration mode. This allows the heat pump system to take more heat from the battery to efficiently heat the cabin instead of maintaining the battery's ability to provide peak acceleration performance. Isn't that interesting? Apparently, if you're in a higher or more aggressive acceleration mode, it holds back some of the battery so that it's able to give you that when you need it. Whereas if you put it in chill mode, grandma mode, it doesn't need to hold that back and it can use it for the cabin heating and it actually makes the heat pump more efficient. I would not have guessed that. So what happened in Chicago? Well, it's hard to get all the facts, but the bottom line is there were huge waits for superchargers and some of them were out of service and this resulted in cars being abandoned because they ran out of charge. Fortunately, a user by the ID of JS May 311 was smart enough to take some pictures out of the app of the supercharger status after the story broke, and it provides some interesting insights of what was going on. Here we can see that it was affecting the whole Chicago area. There's only, what, two superchargers here, and one has one stall available, and the other has two stalls. Oh, there's one up here with three stalls of it. But that's only if the telematics are being accurate, and there's evidence that those weren't working correctly during the situation. All the others have wait time, and three of them are actually shut down completely. And of those that are open, we don't know how many of the stalls themselves are actually down. This is a look at the one near Chicago O'Hare, and of their 14 stalls, one, they said one was available, about a 15 minute wait time, but they had six stalls that were out of order. It seems the majority of abandoned cars were at the Oak Brook Superstation, and he's got a shot of that as well. And it's interesting because it's saying it's closed, but it's also saying five of eight stalls are available and only one of them is out of order. So it would be easy to get confused by that, but it lends us to believe that the telematics were incorrect. Imagine that you were driving there before they put the closure sign up and you thought five out eight stalls were available and only one was out of order. And you get there and you find a three hour line and then you've got to reroute to another supercharger. You may not have the energy to do that or you may get to the next supercharger and the line's an hour or two hours there and you simply don't have enough juice left in your car to last that long. Especially if the car doesn't degrade gracefully and I don't know whether it does or not. So how did the long lines happen in the first place? It's not like Tesla supercharging in cold climates is an unusual activity. Plenty of cars are sold in Norway and Canada and you don't hear these sorts of problems. I suspect that there was a grid issue, but in any case, we do know that there were a lot of stalls down. I mean, just look at the Chicago one again. Six of the 14 stalls were down and we have three stations that are completely closed. So was there a grid issue? It seems likely to me that there was. 
And the long lines are easy to explain. To be the case, a lot of the people depending on supercharging were rideshare people. They might not be aware that you need to precondition the battery. So they show up to the charger. It can take up to half an hour to get the battery up to temperature. Then you've got a half hour to 40 minute charge because it's cold to get you to 80%. And then some people, probably not the Uber drivers because it takes so long, but some people may say, hey, look, I waited two hours here. I'm not going to stop at 80%. I'm going to top off to 100%. And it, it can take more time to take you from 80% to 100% than it does to take you from 15% to 80%. So a charge that might normally take in the cold 30 to 40 minutes with preconditioning and pushing it to 100 could easily triple that. So the lines start to develop because you're only getting one third of the traffic through that you normally would. Well, and then you've got to consider that there are individual stalls down. So maybe half the stalls are out. So you're getting one sixth of the traffic through the supercharger that you normally would. Then you've got three stations that are completely shut down. Those people will be rerouting to other places if they can. So it's easy to see how this could, pun intended, snowball. So that you end up with hour long waits where normally you don't have any waits at all. It's obvious, but it's worth mentioning that for the vast majority of people, this was not an issue at all because they just went home and plugged in. It's people that depend on supercharging for their regular charging, which are people coming through on trips, rideshare drivers that don't have charging equipment at home, and people that may live in apartments and things like that that also don't have charging. So what happened? Hard to tell. Strong evidence that because the sites were down that there was probably a grid problem, especially, you know, since stalls were going down first and then sites were going down. But there's obviously a telematic problem. Drivers can't make intelligent decisions unless they have accurate data. If you're routed to a supercharger that's dead, you may not have enough energy if you've pushed it to get to another supercharger. There was one poor guy who showed up and realized the supercharger was dead and drove to his alternate supercharger only to find that it was dead too. And he ended up having to get his car towed. So even though we don't know for sure, we've got three problems as I see it. One, there likely was a grid problem because Chicago's done this before without these issues. Plenty of cars are sold in cold climates without issues. But that's not an excuse. That's just a situation that Tesla needs to learn to deal with. The other problem I think might be education, that there were drivers showing up not knowing that you had to precondition the battery. So charging times were taking much longer, which was making much longer lines, which means people's batteries were getting more depleted because they had to wait longer to charge. And the third is a telematics problem. People can't make intelligent decisions if they don't know what's happening at the superchargers. Normally the app is great at this. I mean, it gives you estimated wait times, tells you how many stalls are available. But I've been to a supercharger where it told me there were going to be four stalls available and I showed up and there was a 15 minute wait. Well, it looks like some of these people were being told that, hey, like the Oak Brook picture here, five of eight stalls are available. You get there and find out that the whole site is down. Tesla can't act correctly and users can't make correct decisions without telematics. So they've got to be 100% available. I don't know what that require, would require, battery backup, uh, redundant systems, but that telematic data has to work accurately. I also think Tesla needs to have software in place that can triage these sorts of situations. Maybe prioritize people that are running very low at a supercharger so they get in a stall before other people do, but you don't want to reward that sort of behavior. So you might give them enough charge maybe to get back to the end of the line. I don't know how you'd handle it. The car should be able to triage themselves as well. If you've got an hour wait to supercharge, it shouldn't sit there and keep preconditioning the battery for that whole hour. It should stop and then resume like 10 or 15 minutes before the actual charge will begin. If you're getting really low, maybe you turn off climate control and just use the seat heaters to keep warm. And I can't imagine why it lets it get so low that you can't accept a charge. One of the solutions would be to get more Cybertrucks out there and more Teslas with bi-directional charging. That way, if you got in a situation like this, Tesla could send out something like an all points bulletin saying, hey, we've got people that are getting very close to being stranded at this supercharger. We could use some help. Could you bring your Cybertruck over and give them 10% so that they could get to a working supercharger? Another way Tesla could improve is to give more useful information to the drivers. If you hadn't preconditioned, you hook up and it says it's going to precondition, it's going to take this long to avoid this next time, do this and have a video available that they can watch to see how to do it right next time. 
And if there are long wait times at a supercharger, don't say, well, we're going to stop you at 80%, which is easily overridable by the user. Make it set in stone and say, we cannot let you charge past 80% because the time that it would take would adversely affect the wait times at this supercharger. And finally, it sounds like there might have been issues with the service center. They were probably overwhelmed with requests, but there has to be a fallback position where that somebody always answers a service, an immediate service request. Hopefully Tesla and the power grid, if necessary, will take a good hard look at this situation and come up with ways to alleviate such situations in the future. You may have seen my video where regenerative braking locked up the rear wheels and caused me to spin and end up in a ditch. I made a video on that and you can watch it if you want. I've just been using off-road assist when necessary and I changed my way of thinking so that if I get into a slide, I hit the brakes and let ABS take me out of it. And that's been perfectly fine. That's worked great. Well, this year I thought, you know, I'm going to test that again and see if I can get regen to lock up the rear wheels. And so I've probably tried 50 times to take it up to 30, 35 miles an hour, and then come completely off the pedal to see if it'll lock up and back. And even though I felt it give maybe 10 times, it's always recovered every single time. So I get the feeling that they may have fixed this, uh, which is great news. And you know, this is another reason I love Tesla is <laughs> these cars just keep getting better. When have you ever brought a car and had it get better over time? It's just amazing. So take that for what it's worth. But it seems to me that the possibility of regen locking up your rear wheels has been greatly reduced. What can we take away from all this? Well, you are going to lose range in the cold. When compared against a nice car, not awful. Uh, if you preheat your car at home, you'll do just fine. If you preheat your car before going to a supercharger, you'll be fine. You don't need to take my word for this. As they say, the proof is in the pudding. Look at this chart. Number one model in Norway is Tesla. I doubt they're buying those if there's problems in the snow and ice. Just my two cents worth. Thanks for watching. Talk to you later. While looking for clips for this video, I ran across this from a drive I took when it was negative 15 degrees out. This is from the front camera. Looks like it has the potential of hindering full self-driving. And finally, if you're thinking of buying a Tesla, please consider using my referral code. We'll both get some rewards. Thanks again for watching.